that we have to do today. Okay, so the recording has started. All right. So welcome to another session uh, of your NEG3 classes conducted by IGNO, IGNO RC uh, Kochi, the regional center in Kochi. And my name is Anita Menon. And the novel that we are going to do today is The Heart of Darkness. So let me uh, let me get into the presentation. Okay, uh, is this visible to you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, so the novel that we are going to do today is, uh, as you can see displayed on your screen, The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Okay. So uh, coming to uh, the author, he was born as Joseph Theodore Conrad Korzenioski in 1857. Okay. So... Uh, he was born in this place called uh, Burdi Kiv, which was part of the Russian Empire. And he died in 1924, 3rd of August, 1924, age 66, in England. So during the course of his life, you, we see him uh, you know, actually traveling to different places. Uh, though he was born uh, in Poland, he becomes a British uh, uh, British uh, entity by the time of his death. So we'll be talking about all that in the course of the uh, class. Okay. So when he started writing, because uh, his name was something that was that could not be like easy for English readers to understand. So he changed his name to something more British, like Joseph Conrad. That's how he gets the name. His real name is what you see on the screen on the left side. So uh, he has written novels, short stories, and essays. He was born, as I said, a Polish gentleman. And his citizenship, by the time he uh, passed away, he was British. And he, we can, uh, looking at the history of the novel, we can say he occupied the time uh, of modernism uh, from around 1895 to 1923. Uh, and some of his, uh, the genre in which he wrote is definitely, mostly he is known for writing fiction. And Heart of Darkness is a novel that he wrote in 1899. And some of his other well-known uh, works are Lord Jim, 19, uh, 18, uh, sorry, Lord Jim, 1900, Secret Agent, 1907, Under the Western Eyes, 1911. You can see the cover there. So, as the title indicates, Heart of Darkness, this novel is about traveling, about traveling, especially during the time of the colonial, uh, colonialist enterprise. Okay. Now, even from the time that he was very young, okay, Conrad definitely had this passion for travel. And those days, the way in which he could travel was to look at the maps, study the maps. This was also, mind you, the time of imperial, uh, imperialist uh, acquisitions, conquests, so voyages made to different uh, parts of the world, far off places in the world. So uh, as you can see, there are two quotes here. Uh, one is by Marlowe in The Heart of Darkness. One is by this character called Marlowe, who is one of the central characters in the novel that we're going to study, that is Heart of Darkness. Now, the quote is like this. Let me read the quote, okay? Now, when I was a little child, I had a passion for maps. I would look for hours at South America or Africa or Australia and lose myself in all the glories of exploration. At that time, there were many blank spaces on the earth. And when I saw one that looked particularly inviting on a map, but they all looked bad. I would put my finger on it and say, when I grow up, I will go there. The North Pole was one of these places I remember. 
but i haven't been there yet and shall not try now the glamour is off other places were scattered about the equator and in every sort of latitude all over the two hemispheres i have been on some of them and well we won't talk about that but there was one yet the biggest and most bland so to speak i had a hankering after these this is the word uh, or the, this is a um, thought that you know uh, ex- which is expressed by marlow himself okay the central character of the novel we are going to study and what do we understand from that uh, quotation that i just read see when i was a young chap little chap i had a passion for maps mind you as i said this was a time of um, the colonization of far off lands and make, making maps was an enterprise which was a very political thing and uh, as a young boy itself he was very fascinated with this whole uh, cartography and this whole thing of you know looking at maps studying different places and wanting to go to those places and he said that he would put his finger on a particular place on a map and think of about going there at first his uh, hankering was to go to north pole but then you know later on as he grows up he realizes the glamour is off why do you think the glamour is off as i said you know the voyage is major uh, Uh, journeys were undertaken in order to grab power in order to grab wealth with which to make the european nations more and more rich right so the north pole in that sense was a difficult journey and not much to gain not like journeying to asia or africa where the imperialists could always hope to get wealth and precious things that they could take back to their own countries so the uh, the glamour of the appeal of the north pole had waned by the time marlow became a young man still there was you know he had already gone to a lot of places still there was one place uh, which he had a hankering to travel to that was africa okay now uh, that is the quote uh, spoken by the central character in the novel that we are going to study on the other side of the screen you can see uh, a quote from Uh, Conrad, as it appeared in Geography and Some Explorers in 1924. Now this is a quote here. Let me read that. Regions unknown. My imagination could depict to itself their worthy adventurers and devoted men nibbling at the edges, attacking from north and south and east and west, conquering a bit of truth here and a bit of truth there, and sometimes swallowed up by the mystery their hearts were so persistently set on unveiling. So. traveling to unknown regions uh, c- conquerors do that right taking a little bit from here and little bit from there until finally they occupy a vast uh, you know expanse of area only once did that enthusiasm for geography expose me to the derision of my school boy charms so he says you know when i was in school once i was laughed at um, because of my pa- fascination or my passion to look at the uh, geography of the world one day putting my finger on a spot of the then white heart of africa i declared that some day i would go there the white heart of africa white because it was occupied by the colonizers the white men had conquered africa and that's why white heart of africa uh about 18 years afterwards a wretched little stern wheel steamboat i commanded lay moored to the bank of an african river i was glad to be alone on deck smoking the pipe of peace after an anxious day away in the middle of the stream on a little island nestling all black in the foam of broken water a solitary little light glimmered feebly and i sat on myself in awe this is a very spot of my boyhood boast so conrad thinking about himself you know he he became a sailor he did go on several voyages so uh, the same feeling as what marlow expressed uh, conrad himself has already experienced so it is his own experiences as a seaman that he puts into this novel heart of darkness and his fascination from childhood onwards to travel to different places especially africa now going to uh, the biography of joseph conrad 
So Joseph Theodore Conrad Korzniowski was an orphan by the age of 12. His mother and father both died as a result of time. The family spent in exile in Siberia for plotting against the Russian Tsar. This was a time of, uh, you know, the uh, Russians taking over Poland. And uh, as his family, as, as Conrad's family belonged to the Polish nobility, they plotted against the Russian invasion. And for that, they were punished. His parents and he were sent to the farthest reaches of uh, Siberia uh, at 17. And that made him uh, uh, an orphan by the time he was 12 years old. First, his mother passes away. And later on, in just a few years time, his father also passes away. So that was uh, his childhood. At 17, he traveled to Marseille and began to work as a sailor for so Marseille in France south of France. Eventually, he began to sail on British ships and became a British citizen in 1886 at the age of 29. So that is why I said earlier, you know, he was born Polish. He, he was exiled to Siberia, living in a remote uh, area of Russia. Then he went to Marseille, uh, living in France. And then later on, as a grown-up man, he went to England, be becoming a British citizen. So he changed his name to the more British sounding Joseph Conrad and published his first short stories. He wrote in English, his third language after Polish and French. So uh, English is not his native tongue. Okay, just like us, you know, English is not his native tongue. Uh, it was Polish. And then when he went to Marseille, he picked up French. And when he went to England, he picked up uh, English also. He did not know too much of English, yet he started writing in English. So for the next eight years, Conrad continued to work as a sailor, even spending time commanding a steamship in Belgian Congo and continued to write. So when he went to uh, Britain, he worked for like uh, around eight years as a sailor. Even at one point, he was a commander of a steamship and uh, a steamship that traveled to Congo in the heart of Africa. And all this time he was uh, in writing. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Oh. oh, so uh, he published his first novel, Almayer's Folly in 1894. Uh, in 1896, Conrad married Jesse George. He quickly won critical praise uh, though financial success eluded him for many years, and both he and his wife suffered serious illnesses. He wrote his best known works in the year just before and after the turn of the century, that is, Heart of Darkness in 1899, Lord Jim in 1900, Nostroma, which I'm sure you might have heard of, 1904, and in 1924, he passed away. So, this is something in short about uh, his biography. We go into more details about his life, especially as a young boy. So what was life like for him? You know, a young boy who lost his parents very early in life. What was it like? Now let's uh, look at this. Okay, uh, this, this is you know these are parts from your text. So his father, uh, Apollo Kozinowski, was a patriotic member of the landowning class known in Polish as Slaja, or uh, the word for noble man in Polish. And he was involved in the historical struggle to free his homeland from the Russian imperialists. Uh, so the Russian imperialists who had taken over Poland in 1861, when Conrad was barely four years old, his father was pl found plotting and he was incarcerated in Warsaw. He was imprisoned, incarcerated, means imprisoned in Warsaw. And later the Korzenowskis were exiled to the remote province of Voloda, which is in uh, Siberia. Conrad's mother died in 1865. So soon after that, he lost his mother. Then father and son moved to Wau. Uh, then Conrad, the only child of his parents, learned to read and write. He kept his father company by reading up a lot of literature. Well, his father himself was a poet, translator, and a dramatist. So uh, through the early years when he just picked up reading, he would keep company with his father and they would read a lot together because his father was also equally interested in literature. 
Then uh, his father, Apollo, died in 1869. And from then on, Conrad was looked after by his maternal uncle. Uh, continued ill health and privation would mean that he was privately tutored with only occasional schooling. So he, he was uh, always, you know, unhealthy. And also they were not very rich. So he was mostly tutored by private tutors at home. Thus, his life so far was one of sickness, loneliness, intense emotional despair. This was like uh, too much of emotional turbulence for a small boy to undergo. So he was sick and lonely and unhappy most of the time. Then, uh, and also uh, physically, you know, he had undertaken long journeys across Russia and Poland, which was also physically tiring, a haphazard and spotty education and little opportunity to make his own friends. So this was the childhood of Conrad. So in short, we can say he lived a life of loneliness, ill health, and sorrow when he was a young boy. Now, uh, another important character in his life was his maternal uncle who took care of him. So uh, recalling his earliest days, Conrad would say that he used to think of himself as poor, Catholic, and gentleman. This was his self-identity. He, he considered himself Polish, uh, a Catholic person, and a gentleman. One of his childhood fantasies was what you have already read about, uh, in that quotation that we read. Now, this dream of Conrad wouldn't have materialized but for his uncle. This dream of his to travel to far-off places, it wouldn't have materialized had it not been for his uncle, who was his guardian. Uh, his name was Thaddeus Bobrovsky who, until his death in 1894, served Conrad as father, friend, and financial supporter. Theirs was a love-hate relationship. Conrad was a young and romantic dreamer of a maritime life of reckless adventure, while his uncle preferred a sedate life of a conformist, worldly wise, and moralist. So uh, they were of opposite natures, while his uncle preferred to be uh, on land, Conrad wanted to be on high seas enjoying adventures. So uh, quite a romantic dreamer uh, and desiring uh, maritime adventures, whereas his uncle wanted to be landborn and uh, lead a sedate and comfortable life. But at the same time, his uncle was his best supporter through all the you know lows that he had gone through in life. It was his uncle who was his supporter. And going on. See, Conrad did not have an easy childhood, like we already understood from the quotes. He wanted to leave Poland and join the French merchant marine. He was much influenced by the novels of adventure, travel, and exploration. Uh, Kipling and uh, Stevenson, all of these people were writing adventure stories. He was influenced by uh, stories of adventure and exploration that was very popular at that time. It was also politically safer for him as he was a son of a martyr for Polish independence and would have to serve the Russian army. So it was also safer for him to leave uh, that place because uh, as the son of a Polish uh, independence uh, fighter, he would probably be drafted into the Russian army, which was not something that he wanted. So that is why he goes to Marseille in France. So in Marseille, Conrad acquired a vessel with three other men engaged in gun running between France and Spain from 80, 1877 to 1878. He did that. You know, he acquired a vessel, he acquired a uh, boat, uh, um, and with three other men, he would be taking carrying arms from France to Spain. Uh, but the vessel was lost at one point, and. Conrad was so unhappy about it that he attempted suicide. And it was his uncle who rushed to his rescue. So when he was totally dejected, devastated, and he attempted suicide, it was his uncle who came to his rescue. He then went to Britain in 1878 with a vocabulary of around 100 words. He obtained an officer's position and a ship to sail to Australia. So he hardly knew any English. When he went to Britain for the first time, he hardly knew any English, just a vocabulary of around 100 words. Then he went, uh, he got on a ship that was sailing to Australia, went to, uh, sailed to Australia. Uh, he now acquired a tricultural identity. So this is important. He acquired a tricultural identity. 
uh, he was Polish, he had lived in France, he was a British citizen, and he was also quite well traveled around the world, right? In a way, you know, uh, though it gave him a tricultural identity, we can say that he was a marginal man, actually not belonging uh, fully uh, in any of the places that he went to. Wherever he went, he didn't belong there completely. So we can say he was sort of like a marginal man uh, around the margins, uh, away from the mainstream. He called himself a duplex man, a Polish nobleman, a British citizen, a successful later as both a mariner and author. Uh, so look at this. He has like almost like a uh, dual identity, a duplex man, you know, a man who has two sides to himself, uh, a Polish nobleman, British citizen. Uh, then he was a mariner. He was an author. Uh, he was an insistent moralist and also an unabashed skeptic. So he could be moralist and he could also be very skeptic about the things that were happening around him. He was very pessimistic and also very human. So there was a two, two sides to his uh, character. You can say he was a duplex man, a tricultural identity and a duplex man. Now Marlowe from the Heart of Darkness was his favorite raconteur. Raconteur means through whose um, through whose words uh, Conrad could talk to his readers. Okay. So Marlowe, the character from Heart of Darkness, was his favorite raconteur. He experienced, uh, Conrad experienced two great empires, the Russian Empire and the British. He was victim of the Russian Empire and served the British. So see again the duality happening there. He was a victim of the Russian imperialism, but he served the British uh, country the country of britain so he served that and uh, uh, the part of yeah so uh, a little bit more detail about what happened you know the part of poland where he was born had been annexed by the russians and was under the Tsar. his father was one of the freedom fighters to free poland from russian imperialism so that is why he had he was punished his father was punished by being banished to siberia so is that clear so far? Yes, ma'am. Okay, going on. Now, you know, this was also the time uh, when uh, the European countries were, you know, just falling over one another to divide up, cut up all the other countries that they could voyage to and plundering those countries, exploiting them, using every resource that they could find in these colonized countries in order to make Europe wealthier. So uh, talking about that, you know, King Leopold and the Congo, we have to talk about this aspect okay, because it's integral to the novel. 19th century was a time of intense European imperialistic ventures when there was a scramble for Africa. Missionaries, explorers, scientists, greedy businessmen were all rushing, you know, to exploit the resources of the land. Industrialization was happening in Europe, right? They were producing things and they needed raw materials and they also needed markets. So for this reason, you know, colonization was at its height, you can say. Especially there was a mad scramble for Africa because Africa as a land offered these greedy Europeans lots of riches, lots of treasures. Now, when David Livingstone was lost in East Central Africa in 1866, Stanley, uh, a journalist, you know, in a publicity stunt, found him near Lake Tanganyika in 1871. So this famous explorer, David Livingstone, he was supposed to be lost. No one had heard of him for a long time uh, in East Central Africa in the year 1866. And so a mission was set out uh, to find this David Livingstone. And Stanley, a journalist, in a very dramatic way, uh, found him You know, uh, somewhere near Lake Tanganyika. Tanganyika is Tanzania in 1871. King Leopold became interested in Congo after this mission by Stanley, and he set upon a civilizing mission in Africa. So King Leopold of Belgium uh, you know, set his eyes on plundering Africa. After this mission of Stanley finding out lost David Livingstone from the heart of Africa, King Leopold's eyes turned towards Africa, towards Congo in particular. 
King Leopold of Belgium. Uh, and he set upon this civilizing mission in Africa. Now, you already know that these colonialist powers, they say civilizing mission, we know that what exactly is civilizing mission, right? Civilizing mission is a word that they used, right? Even when they came to India, they said these things, right? They ultimately, they would take over the land and plunder that land and you know, squeeze it bone dry. This is what they normally do. So King Leopold, uh, went to Congo in Africa with this uh, explanation of having to civilize uh, Africa. The mission was to civilize Africa. Now the question, you know, that question that immediately comes up in our mind is, why should that be civilized, right? I mean, they had a culture of their own. They had a lifestyle of their own. They had knowledge of their own. Why would anybody want to go and civilize them and they were already civilized just like we indians had our own civilization right so this was nothing but another word for getting you know granting themselves this power to go and exploit a country then uh, look at uh, so uh, uh, within brackets see refer names at the heart of darkness at conrad gave Stanley Pool, Stanley Falls, etc. Stanley Pool and Stanley Falls comes from the name of this uh, Stanley who found out uh, missing David Livingston, right? Now, there was another thing like, you know, uh, when these Europeans went to uh, these countries like uh, uh, Africa and other uh, colonized countries, they could, they gave them Europeanized, the places were given Europeanized names. Now, this is nothing but, uh, you know, a way of territorializing the places that they went to, kind of establishing it as their territory, right? Taking possession of these places. Look at it. It's a political act. Then. From 1885 to 1908, Congo Free State was exploited to levels that crossed all limits. The king got support from international finance companies as the profits were tremendous coming mostly from ivory, rubber and minerals. So the next years, you know, uh, supposed to be like one of the uh, uh, you know, terrible, most terrible years as far as human exploitation was concerned. Now all the uh, financial companies in Belgium and Europe, you know, gave support to uh, King Leopold's civilizing mission because it brought them lots of wealth, okay, especially in terms of uh, ivory and rubber and minerals, such things, you know, gave wealth to European countries. And there was mindless looting and plunder in Congo. It is said that around 10 million people lost their lives during this time. 10 million, around 10 million natives were killed or maimed or wounded or see look at the picture there on the screen you can see uh, this uh, colonizer the white man standing with a native there whose hands you know whose hand has been chopped off right the the worst punishments the most barbaric punishments were given on these uh, given to these natives so does that africa became something you know that caught the imagination of the european and to the Europeans sitting at home, you know, reading about these things, it, these became stories of adventure, glory, glorifying this whole enterprise. But in reality, it was something other than that. So uh, there came this image of the European as a traveler. And the things, the words that were easily uh, associated with uh, a, a European as a traveler was, you know, uh, the figure of a guy in a hat, solar topi, you know, that's, a, that's what that man in the picture is wearing, uh, a map, mosquito boots, uh, and solar topi. This became the representation of an Englishman, in, in, you know, sorry, not Englishman, a European, you know, a, a European uh, imperialist person, one who went into Africa to invade, to conquer, to plunder, and to punish and kill mindlessly. So King Leopold and uh, Congo and the soul civilizing mission has a very deep, dark undertow, a sinister undertow. Now, what exactly was happening? See, the white man in the heart of darkness. Okay, 1886, Conrad became a British citizen. By looking for a ship, he met Albert Tours. 
aide camp of uh, king leopold the second so a aide camp means someone who was uh, like the right hand man of king leopold the second a society called society anonyme belge pour le commerce du hot congo so a belgian society for commerce you know had been founded by the king to develop upper congo basin and run a railway between the mouth of the congo river and stanley pool so you can see the uh, map there on the screen if you uh, you know if you just and larger you can see uh, stanley pool you can see that was at the you know beginning of the river to stanley pool stanley falls you know so uh, uh, so he uh, the king wanted to you know so that uh, conveyance or uh, transportation becomes easier a railway system uh, was kind of you know established between the mouth of the congo river a uh, congo river a huge uh, river you know so starting you can see on the map from where it starts like around a point called matadi it starts uh, it starts from around that place and uh, goes on this railway line went on to stanley pool the contract sailed to congo and reached matadi 6 weeks later facing the heart of darkness Conrad kept two diaries, one of which gives daily account of the journey of 250 miles from Matadi to Selamba near Stanley Pool. So uh, his journey was recorded in his diary. Now you can see uh, a little bit, you know, uh, of the quotation there. This is what it is. Okay, let me read it. The upper part of the gigantic Python-like river, where the currents were navigable, was cut off from the rapids of Matadi. thus all the provisions and all the necessities of life were carried by porters so once they reached this matadi you know there was the upper part of the river was cut off from the rest of the river so everything had to be taken out of the river carried by porters and uh, then the river beca became navigable again this had to be reassembled you know including the steam boats had to be reassembled so that they could go down the river further let me continue reading this the all the provisions and other necessities of life were carried by porters the image of the serpent like river and the task of carrying the requirements of empire building are to be found in the heart of darkness so uh, this uh, river you know uh, is like a serpent like a huge python or like a huge serpent uh, lying across africa and this whole task of carrying the empire building equipment uh, is described in the heart of darkness you know so how these colonizers uh, carried these things you know disbanded them at one point and uh, reassembled them when the river became uh, navigable again now the steam boats too were taken apart and carried off to be reassembled when navigation was possible the railway was to be completed only in 1897 and uh, this was such a difficult journey this was such a depressing and difficult journey having to fight you know uh, environments that were very hostile so uh, conrad you know felt very 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 uh, depressed during this whole uh, exercise okay he found the entire exercise dismal monotonous and uncomfortable if not horrifying on occasion he noted depressing details in his diary uh see one of the quotations from this day on the road today passed a skeleton tied to a post also white man's grave no name heaps of stone in the form of a cross 19 days after they began the journey they reached the port area of stanley pool the central station of heart of darkness soon he was on board a steamer as mate on its way to stanley falls to relieve an ailing company agent by the name of clay so uh, uh he writes in his diary you know so today when we passed okay uh, it, we we saw a skeleton tied to a post and also heap of stones in the shape of a cross so some uh, some uh, colonizer some one of the imperial uh, imperial forces men probably had died and you know no proper grave just a heap of stones in the form of a cross 19 days after this difficult journey they reached uh, stanley pool the port area of stanley pool and from there he had to take another steamer 
uh, and go deeper down to Stanley Falls. Look at the map, you can see that area, you know, from Stanley Pool, going deeper into the heart of Congo to reach Stanley Falls. Now, he was going to Stanley Falls uh, because there was a company agent, one of the uh, trading companies, the uh, imperialist trading companies agent called Klein, who, who was not there. And they were going to uh, take him back to uh, civilization, to back uh, to uh, the main towns. Okay, So they had gone down the Congo River in order to reach Stanley Falls so that they could uh, they could bring uh, required help to claim okay uh, you may be surprised to know that conrad had originally thought of giving this name to the character kurtz now you find the same thing happening in the heart of uh, darkness also you find uh, charles marlow or charlie marlow uh, traveling down the river in order to bring required help and assistance to Kurtz, who was uh, a, a company man uh, in the heart of uh, Congo, who was uh, sick, who was ailing. So the so it could be, you know, Kurtz was um, based on uh, this experience that he had with Klein when he was traveling down the boat. The following recollection accurately captures Conrad's disillusionment with the entire enterprise and also his disgust at the publicity surrounding Stanley. Uh, so uh, Conrad, during the course of this travel, became very disillusioned with this uh, whole colonial enterprise, the imperial enterprise. Okay, There was nothing noble, nothing uh, that, you know, was... Uh, good or glorious about this whole enterprise and also the publicity surrounding Stanley and how he, he found out David Livingston who was supposed to be lost. It all sounded pretty hollow to Conrad. Now this is what he writes. See, a great melancholy descended on me yet this was a very spot but there was no shadowy friend to stand by my side in the night of the enormous wilderness. Only the unholy recognition, sorry, recollection of a prosaic newspaper stunt and the distasteful knowledge of the wildest scramble for loot that ever disfigured the history of human conscience and geographical exploration. So this is what is important. The words in italics, you know, that is what is important. So when he reached Congo, he realized that there is nothing glorious. All this, you know, the whole thing of finding out David Livingston, Stanley going there, finding him, and uh, King Leopold uh, setting out on a civilizing mission, etc. There was nothing glorious in that. It just seemed to be a distasteful newspaper stunt. And when he reached there, he understood that, you know, what was happening there was the wildest scramble, the worst, wildest, you know, most uh, heartless scramble for loot that ever disfigured the history of human conscience and geographical exploration. So I told you, this time uh, during uh, this time around 10 million people lost their lives. So you can imagine how uh, uh, how ruthless and how uh, you know mindless this exploration, the so-called exploration or rather plunder, might have been. So uh, Conrad was very quick to realize that. Now, uh, they went, uh, Conrad's steamboat was going uh, to uh, Stanley Falls area in order to bring necessary assistance to Clay, a company agent who was uh, in Stanley Falls area who was sick. But Clay died on the return journey when Conrad was in charge of the steamer after Captain Coach fell ill. So... He, he had gone on the steamboat as a sailor, but on the way, when Captain fell ill and uh, he could not take control of the steamboat, uh, Conrad became the captain of the steamboat. And they were bringing Klain back, to, uh, coming down the river, but Klain did not make it. You know, he died on the way. Uh, on the return journey, he died. So though the parallel exists between Kurtz and Klein, the same thing happens to Kurtz also. He, they bring try to bring Kurtz back, but he dies uh, also. So though the parallel exists between Kurtz and Klein, it's Conrad's experiences and stories he heard of other adventurers that went into the creation of the character of Kurtz. So it's not 
uh, strictly the story of clay it is a mixture of all the stories and all the experiences that conrad had had and also from what he had heard from other explorers that you find uh, written in heart of dark So Conrad returned to England in November 1891 with gout, rheumatism, neuralgia, and malaria. So he had gone to Africa, the heart of Africa, uh, just the place where he had imagined he would be when he was a boy. He had seen what was happening. He had realized there was nothing glorious in that journey. There was only uh, only this vilest scramble for loot and plunder that mankind had ever attempted. now he came back to england very sick he had gout and rheumatism and malaria all of these things caused by his travel to africa the intensity of his experiences in congo was so powerful that he could recapture the horror of it only 8 years later in the novel heart of darkness now we often hear the stories of how uh, soldiers who go to battle come back with uh, post traumatic stress disorder things like that right ptsd Uh, people who have been uh, uh, under uh, terrible stress, so something like that happened to him. Also, when he came back, it took him nearly eight years to think about the uh, terrible experiences he had and try to put them down in the form of a novel, which is what we see as Heart of Darkness. Uh, so he, I uh, see, when the uh, at the time that he went on this uh, voyage to the heart of Africa to Congo. you know the british uh, imperial powers were something that was really vast okay almost the whole of uh, you know the world they had under their control look at the court there see european imperial rule over non european world extended to nearly 2/3 of the earth's land surface in unimaginable right not only britain europe as a whole you know whether it is uh, belgium uh, uh, other european powers including britain france all of these powers together had taken over 2/3 of the earth's surface so they were the powers ruling over most of the land area on the planet now they had colonies see britain's empire had a major share in the booty colonies in oceania new zealand australia strait settlements federated malay states to india canada africa caribbean china and the more informal empire of trade in south america and the british empire look at that this was the extent of the power that you know these european uh, colonizers exerted over the rest of the world so thus the empire conrad served was very extensive by the end of the century it would expand even more than that so uh, on that slide on the you know left bottom you can see the picture there of the steam boats traveling down the congo river now going on uh, in his political sympathies conrad had become conservative he was not a liberal he was conservative great britain had become home to him he was fully disillusioned with the reality he encountered in congo so be all these were part of his you know experiences now he was a conservative yet he had also seen the devastation that the imperial powers had wreaked in uh, congo on his return the possibility of writing about his rich experiences to the english speaking world was attractive he wrote to his publisher about his first story an outpost of progress now first story that he wrote you know was about uh, was titled an outpost of progress now the story was about the civilizing mission going on in africa uh, civilizing mission is written within single inverted commas because we know that this the so called civilizing mission was only the mission to plunder and loot africa two popular ideas that he subverted Uh, there were no women no love angle and secondly the idea of travel adventure as written by stevenson and others was quite different from conrad's attempts to exorcise himself of the traumatic experiences and describe the criminality and inefficiency and pure selfishness in the civilizing mission so uh, when he wrote a letter to his uh, publisher you know the on the right side that is a letter part of the letter that he wrote to his publisher 
so this is how we uh, summarized the story that he was writing uh, the first story that he wrote an outpost of progress now this is what he wrote to his publisher look at this it's a story of the congo there's no love in it and no villain only incidentally means no major women characters and no love angle in it the exact locality is not mentioned all the bitterness of those days all my puzzled wonder as to the meaning of all i saw all my indignation at basquerading philanthropy have been with me again by my road so uh, this is how he explains the book you know there's no love angle there's no women uh, only what you see there you know is my indignation and my puzzlement at people who were pretending to be philanthropic masquerading philanthropy philanthropy love of mankind right also pretending to be philanthropist the story is simple there's hardly any description the most common incidents are related the life uh, in a lonely station on the kasai i have divested myself of everything but pity and some scorn by putting the insignificant events that bring on the catastrophe so this is how he explains the book to his publisher so uh, no villain no love angle only uh, the pity that he felt when he saw this uh, you know uh, the hypocrisy of people uh, pretending to be philanthropic but you know look seeing the levels of cruelty that they were uh, unleashing on africa now uh, so so he knew what actually the civilizing mission meant right the reality of the civilizing mission was very clear to him and he was disillusioned with that totally uh, you know uh, disenchanted by this whole uh, thing of travel and adventure uh, so the way he looked at travel and adventure was colored by his experiences and it was quite different from the popular books that were being written at that time uh, by uh, writers like you know stevenson who gave a very romantic and sort of a glorious uh, story of adventure now conrad's experiences were not like that and he was too much of a realist uh, to not write it like he experienced so all the trauma that he had undergone was poured into his book and and this book an outpost of progress was a partial success and he was more successful in his heart of darkness so his experiences the trauma that he had undergone the uh, the consciousness of you know the selfishness of the civilizing mission all of these are the themes that get poured into his book that get Uh, written about in his books the first book that he wrote was a partial success outpost of progress the, uh, the full uh, extent of his ideas could be expressed completely in his novel the heart of darkness now conrad's treatment of the subject was not a stereotypical one like the stereotypical one i told you was like something like stevenson and others used to write glorifying this whole uh, aspect of travel and adventure he castigates the whole colonial enterprise okay he does not uh, support the colonial enterprise because he was part of it he has seen what actually happens and he has been horrified by the levels of pure selfishness that people exhibit there so he castigates the whole colonial enterprise heart of darkness is darkness within within the protagonist's mind and also of the white race so heart of darkness is actually uh, not uh, when we say darkness we associated with africa right those days africa was called by the whites as a dark continent so heart of darkness is something uh, which is a journey into the interior uh, the interior of uh, the man's heart uh, of our own heart right of how the protagonist mind understands that the darkness lies within not externally it is something that lies within and especially within the white race out on a mission out on a selfish mission of civilizing the rest of the world so the the title becomes more uh, significant in this light when we realize that heart of darkness is not just a not just about uh, traveling to the heart of africa 
but rather traveling to the heart of this uh, uh, protagonist mind where he realizes that the white man civilizing mission is very hollow very hypocritical and very selfish not only that also something that is very violent now let's go and look at some of the literary analysis that we have here <clears throat> So uh, when we talk about this novel, we have to talk about technique, okay? The kind of techniques that Conrad employed in order to narrate the story. So questions of technique are inseparable from questions of ideological issues concerning the order, ideological issues about the whole colonial enterprise. That is very much uh, interwoven into the technique of uh, you know, narration, how the technique of uh, bringing out the novel and recounting the whole story is used by the uh, writer. Now, uh, one of the points here, see, time and distance. Okay, uh, how is it uh, used in the novel? Uh, the point of view, how do we look at it? Point of view means POV or point of view. From whose eyes are we told the story? From, through whose uh, narration do we understand the story. Okay. So in a realistic novel, generally the narrative voice is omniscient. Right? One who uh, knows what is happening with every character, uh, the whole uh, action, everything is revealed to the omniscient narrator who's almost like a god-like figure. The identification between the omniscient narrator or the implied author and the historical author is almost complete. So that is a joining of all of these different narrators, the, the godly omniscient narrator or the implied narrator uh, and also the historical author, who one who keeps in touch with historically what is happening. So uh, that is joined together. He is the reliable narrator of whose point of view is God's eye view. So this omniscient narrator who knows everything about everyone and uh, what is happening with everyone. Uh, he knows everything. That is almost like a God's eye view. So he, such a narrator is a reliable narrator. Uh, and who decides what is right or what is wrong? Very little is left in terms of open-endedness and ambiguity. So in such a narration, in such a realistic narration, usually the narrator is like an omniscient narrator who knows everything about what is happening and who decides what is right and what is wrong. And very little scope for anything that is ambiguous. There is no lack of clarity. Everything is you know, completely defined. So nothing ambiguous in the narration. Some novelists departed from this sort of narration. Okay, a narrator introducing another who tells a tale. Innovations like this can be noticed in pre-novelistic works as in the narrative poetry of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So some writers departed from this uh, tradition of an omniscient narrator talking about every other character and talking about every action in the story and went on to introduce uh, innovations, something on the lines of what Chaucer attempted in his Canterbury Tales. Uh, Chaucer in Canterbury Tales, how does he bring in the narration? He introduces the innkeeper, right? There is a very uh, uh, a strict pattern to the way in which that whole story is brought about, right? Uh, the innkeeper is the one who uh, ties it all up together, right? He has all these pilgrims who are out on the journey. And he uh, promises a reward to the one who narrates the best story. And all the pilgrims start narrating one story after the other. So that gives them a chance to uh, bring in their story, which is all connected with the main story of uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So this is a narrative technique that Chaucer employed. And we find such uh, narrative techniques also employed in the epistolary novels. Epistolary novels, what does that mean? Can anyone tell me? Hello. Hello. No idea, ma'am. Epics, ma'am? 
Okay, I, I was, I don't know how many of you. So, epistolary novel is one uh, that is written in the form of a letter. Epistolary. Epistles are letters. Okay. Epistolary novels. Okay. Uh, novels written in the form of letters. Okay. So, uh, innovation where uh, the narrator introduces another who tells a tale can be found even in pre novelistic works like the narrative poetry of Chaucer's uh, Canterbury Tales or in the epistolary novels. The, the, these epistolary novels, usually, you know, the early uh, works that were published in periodicals on a monthly basis or, uh, uh, I mean, once in two weeks. Right, so uh, the, these appear in the forms of letters. Okay, that pre-novelistic, like the early forms of the novels. By the time we get to such modernist texts as uh, James Joyce's works or Virginia Woolf's works, the stability of such narratorial, all-embracing consciousness has disappeared. So when we come to uh, modernist writing, you know. Such a uh, such a reliability or such a uh, stability of the narrator's all embracing voice has disappeared. So there is no uh, no uh, utter reliability on any of the narrator by the time we come to the modernist period. Appearing in its place is a fractured consciousness, and the techniques now employed was called stream of consciousness or monologue interior where the reader could understand what is happening the the dilemmas faced by the characters in their mind uh, that form of writing you know was um, uh, it, it was william james who first used this uh, term stream of consciousness or monologue interior so that the kind of talk that goes on within our uh, mind you know before we say something out loud there's always, look at it, like there's always a voice that goes on inside of yourself, talking to yourself. Have you ever noticed it? If you make your, if you keep quiet for a minute and see, there is some other voice within us that keeps talking to us, right? This is an interior monologue. That was given a chance to come out in the modernist writings, especially in this form of writing, which we call as a stream of consciousness. Two key figures in this regard are Henry James and Conrad. So Conrad's practice of style is a literary and textual equivalent of the impressionist strategy of painting. Uh, the way Conrad wrote was almost like an impressionist painting. You know, an impressionist painting, uh, like uh, the paintings of Monet. I don't know whether you are familiar with that. Uh, let me see if I can show it. Okay, okay, I can't change this. Okay, I'll show it to you later. I'll put it on the WhatsApp group. Like, uh, if you have if you have your phones or, uh, you know, Google right now, just look it up. Uh, for, like, you know, the paintings of Impressionists, uh, like Monet, uh, Monet Sunset. You know, they used to, how they painted was like, you know, they did not attempt to paint in a realistic way. Uh, for example, if they were painting the sunset, uh, the whole feeling of the sunset, you know, like it's almost looking at, uh, uh, look at the, you know, world right in front of you. Uh, you just, uh, you know, uh, what is, close your lids to just a tiny chink and look at the world. You don't see the outlines uh, with clarity. You see a blurred outline of everything in front of you. That is, yet you know that what you're seeing is the table in front of you or the wall or the door or the television or whatever it is that is in front of you. You know that, but it's not there before you in all its uh, firm and hard and realistic lines. There is sort of blur there, right? You get the impression of these things in front of you. That is the way in which impression is painted. If it is sunset, you know, you would get the impression of the sunset from looking at the painting or the wind. You could get the impression of the wind from the painting. It was not a realistic representation. So that same kind of uh, style was adopted by Conrad in his literary uh, uh, way of presentation. So through words, he would uh, employ this impressionist uh, way of writing. 
uh, so uh, a new point of view you know so conrad smarlo is a trans textual character uh, he doesn't appear just in one text he comes in other texts on, written by conrad uh, had he spoken in his own voice and not ventriloquized through marlo questions about english authority of the narrator would be raised so for marlo uh, for sorry conrad a narrator like marlo was very important because conrad was not an englishman by birth right he had come to england and had become an english citizen so when he expressed his thoughts which were not always in agreement with this whole british imperialistic policy he would be questioned people would not take to his works as easily as they would if marlo uh, if marlo was saying that so conrad needed a character like marlo to express his ideas so through marlo he could say what he wanted to say yet he could achieve a sense of distance from what was being said so that the british audience the english audience who was reading his book would not uh, dismiss him so conrad's marlo is a trans textual character had he spoken in his own voice okay had Ma, had conrad spoken in his own voice and not ventriloquized through marlo questions about the english authority of the narrator would be raised right so the english uh, readers would raise questions about uh, conrad's authority to write like this so through marlo conrad could present his own complex experiences and ideas even while maintaining an appropriate ironic distance so it was a very like like a safety net that he had you know marlo through marlo he could say what he wanted to say he could say cut and dry what he wanted to say yet he could you know protect himself through this character of marlo so there would be an ironic distance because if he was questioned he could he could say it's not exactly me talking it's my character talking so marlo outside the heart of darkness in his early novels Conrad employs the voice of the traditional omniscient narrator. The novel's version of social and political England was coloured by Conrad's anxiety to please the editor. In his earlier works, he uh, was not so uh, so forthright or so forthcoming because he was not sure of how his works would be received, and he was not popular yet, right? So he wanted to please the editor. He contributed three tales, including. a heart of darkness to blackwood's magazine it was called maga those days it was in these that marlo made his debut as chief narrator protagonist and allowed conrad to communicate with his english readers so marlo was like a safety net for conrad to say what he wanted to say yet not be dismissed by his english readers now uh the stories were contributed to blackwood's magazines okay which was like you know popular uh, with the english readers so the smarlo appears to be at first sight as alter ego but on closer scrutiny the two emerge as separate entities right so although uh, marlo appears to be the uh, you know alter ego like a mouthpiece for conrad on uh, closer uh, scrutiny we understand that both of them are quite different characters different entities different personalities conrad could distance himself from his narrator persona thereby gaining more control of writing about his experiences without sentimentalizing them so uh, it gave you know the character of marlo gave him the objectivity that was required in order to write about his experiences at the same time not uh, drown himself in the sentimentality of his own experience So Charles Marlowe is unmistakably English and easily relatable to the readers of Maga. Uh, as a sailor, uh, as a seaman who had gone on several voyages, the readers of Maga could easily connect with a character like Charles Marlowe. Conrad too had his had changed his name from Conrad with a K to C O N R A D, more British sounding name. Now Marlo, uh, that is Charlie Marlo, a model English gentleman, ex-officer of the Merchant Marine, was the embodiment of all Conrad would wish to be if he were to become completely Anglicized. So we know he is not a completely Anglicized person, right? Polished by birth, having lived in France and then adopted Britain as uh, his own country, uh, he always was a man on the margins. 
uh, yet Marlowe was not like that. You know, to uh, to the English people, Marlowe was a character that they could identify with and relate to. A British soldier, a British gentleman, and and uh, uh, ex naval officer. Uh, he was in the merchant marine, so somebody that the English people could connect with. Thanks to Marlowe's duality, uh, which is different from his own status as homo duplex, okay, Conrad status as homo duplex, a uh, man who had two identities. Conrad could feel solidarity with and a sense of uh, belonging to England by proxy, at the same time maintaining a distance towards the creation of one's imagination. So Marlowe was a proxy that Conrad needed, okay, to be English, speak to English people, yet retain his sense of distance from them. So Marlowe was a typical proxy that he enjoyed having. Uh, are you understanding what I'm saying? Ah, I hope you're with yes, me. I hope you can understand. Yes, okay, great. All right. Uh, the narrator who introduces Marlowe does so as an outsider who has an idealized view of England to win over the English reader. Conrad uses a double vision for a very complex response to British imperialism and by implication to European imperialism. Now, uh, the narrator, there is a, a a narrator who introduces Marlowe in Heart of Darkness. Marlowe is not uh, the only narrator. Okay, there is another narrator, uh, and the scene is uh, you know on the decks of a ship. Uh, it is on the Thames. It's waiting for the tide to come in to go into uh, deeper into the river, and while they are waiting, you know uh, the the main narrator talks about. Uh, talks about events and then Marlowe as a narrator takes over. So we have two narrators there, the, the narrator and then Marlowe, uh, the second narrator. So where the narrator who introduces Marlowe does so as an outsider he, who has an idealized view of England to win over the English reader. So you see the there is a protective net for Conrad. Yeah, the narrator who introduces Marlowe is someone who uh, has an idealized view of uh, the English imperialism and English uh, power over the uh, colonies. Okay. Now, Conrad uses a double vision for a very complex response to British imperialism and by implication to European imperialism. So you find that Conrad does not outright uh, talk about his uh, criticism or critical uh, standpoint towards the British imperialism and uh, when he talks about British imperialism directly it refers to European imperialism on the whole. So he doesn't talk about it directly. Instead he uses uh, different narrators. One is the uh, first narrator in Heart of Darkness and then uh, the second narrator is Marlowe. So he, this is a complex technique that he, he uses in order to bring in that sense of distance between himself as a writer and the characters that he is presenting so that he is not criticized so that, you know, the English, uh, English readers do not dismiss his standpoint because uh, Conrad was uh, bringing out a kind of standpoint that was so different from all the other writers who were writing at that time. They were all glorifying the imperialist em enterprises. They were all glorifying the colonies and the sense of uh, voyages and adventures. Whereas Conrad was talking in a totally different uh, standpoint. So Conrad uh, uses these characters and narrative techniques in order to say what he wants to say. At the same time, uh, ensure that he's not dismissed by his readers. Uh, in an outpost of progress, there seems to be a pun intended on the word progress as advancement in terms of civilization, as well as movement forward as an adventure or action. Uh, is it really progress, right? So there's a pun on the word progress. Pun means playing upon the word. Okay? Uh, Shakespeare was very fond of using puns. He would say something, but it would actually mean something else. Okay, so a pun is like a, it's a technique used by writers. 
so uh, in an outpost of progress there seems to be a fun intended uh, i mean playing upon that word progress it's an advancement in terms of civilization when we say progress as a civilization it means moving forwards as well as a movement forward as an adventure or action so outpost of progress you know like uh, in the very far reaches of progress so the, uh, there is uh, a play in the novel within the within the title of the uh, book conrad seems to be mocking at belgian imperialism in free state congo at imperialism generally and at the hubris of civilization so uh, when he says outpost of progress he is actually mocking he's making fun he's digging at the imperialism uh, the Bre belgian imperialism the the vilest of imperialistic policies that was carried out in the heart of africa in congo so conrad is actually uh, criticizing that and he says uh, outpost of progress he's mocking that he's ridiculing that and free state congo no nothing free about that state right in the imperialist hands and he talks about the hubris of civilization hubris is a greek word which means pride or arrogance you know uh, the arrogance that sometimes human beings have right the uh, hubris goes usually before a fall like we say in english pride goes before a fall right so hubris is that pride you know it's a greek word uh which is like you know too much of pride uh, which can lead to a fall so uh this is this throws light on the very hubris of civilization how the europeans were so arrogant about their power over the rest of the world that they could assume you know they they could presume actually it's not assume it's presume uh they could presume to be superior they could presume to take over the rest of the world and have the audacity to think that they can civilize the rest of the world okay then uh europeans in spite of their civilization are not necessarily the fittest race right uh, time of charles darwin survival of the fittest yet we see that you know europeans in spite of their civilization they hold themselves in a power of superior in a position of superiority saying that they are civilized and therefore equipped to civilize the rest of the world yet we find that they are not the fittest of race it is the natives who maintain their sanity so when uh, things happen within the novel you find that it's not the uh europeans who maintain their sanity they are not able to when they journey deep into africa the europeans lose their sanity but it is the natives who uh, retain their sanity marlow elaborates on the national character of the english uh, english as well uh, direct as a well directed strategy aimed at co-opting the readership of the magazine exploiting their ideological mindset so uh, uh what malo does here is use the mindset of uh, you know the preset uh, minds of the english uh, so that he can take the readership into his confidence exploiting their ideological mindset malo praising the english crew was a calculated move by conrad for the magazine where it was first published so uh marlow when the when the novel begins when the story begins marlow talks about the great power of britain uh, the efficiency of uh, britain you know and how for that efficiency everybody was ready to uh, bring in their sacrifices so that was like a calculated move by conrad because by praising the english he could manage to uh, get the english readership to his side so such partisan attitude to englishness changed as conrad became more confident of his literary success so this was because he was in his early days as a writer he was not uh, very confident that he would be well received he was not even a native englishman he remember when we read he read, he went into england with just a smattering of 100 words of english from that he became a writer in english so he was not very confident whether his ideas even his ideas were very different from what was being written at that time 
so he was not very confident about how he would be taken in by the readers so for that he employs marlowe and other narrators to first praise the british uh, seamen and then having won the hearts of the british readers the english readers he goes on to talk about what he wants to talk marlowe and the heart of darkness conrad wrote to the publisher of the blackwoods magazine the title i'm thinking of is the heart of darkness but the narrative is not gloomy the criminality of inefficiency and pure selfishness when tackling the civilizing work in africa is a justifiable idea so it's criminal you know the level of inefficiency the level of selfishness that the imperialists uh, exhibit when they are in uh, colonies like africa uh, it, it is really it's something which is you know uh, almost criminal in its uh, levels you know so uh, inefficiency and selfishness to the highest levels almost to criminal levels so that is what i'm thinking of writing and the title that i'm thinking of is the heart of darkness but the narrative is not a gloomy narrative so this is what he writes to this publisher he uses a convention of the frame narrator a convention that was especially popular with maga and already used by writers such as h g wells rudyard kipling and r l stevenson this had its roots in the club culture where travelers and adventurers would narrate their stories conrad tales are removed from the comfort and security of club and are situated symbolically on the decks with endless waters around thus the convention is followed in the dream chat so typically you know uh, the kind of narration that these uh, englishmen were familiar with was a sort of a frame narration especially because you know they would read these stories uh, sitting in clubs uh, talking about their experiences okay during their various uh, voyages so this was a situation that they were very familiar with people gathering in clubs sitting down talking about their experiences so that framework he uses conrad also uses except from the club he shifts the location to the deck of a ship Uh, when the novel opens they are taken to the deck of a ship where there are these uh, sailors waiting for the right tide to go in the river is thames okay uh, all around them you can see the uh, the glory of the uh, wonderful city of london and we, when when we are there we naturally think of uh, river congo right the great river congo Uh, so sailing down that vast river with all its hardships with all its uh, unforeseen dangers right uh, and all the wealth and loot and plunder that all these imperialists do uh, finally where does it all go it reaches these european countries right so thames becomes great and majestic and the city of london becomes great and majestic and uh, a uh, wonderful because of uh, a river like uh, river congo right the 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 mysterious dark and unnavigable river uh, up the congo so that is what actually makes uh, thames or feeds into you know the wealth and uh, grandeur of a city like london so he uses the convention of the frame narrator so uh, one narrator introducing the other narrator and the second narrator taking over the story so this was a convention that was popular with the readers of manga manga is a blackwood magazine because they were used to sitting in clubs and talking about their uh, journeys uh, only thing is Con- conrad uses the same technique but he uh, breaches it like uh, the setting is different Uh, in conrad's novel the setting is not the club rather the deck of the ship that was on the thames so here you can see the picture you know like uh, it shows very clearly how this uh, frame narration is employed by conrad so this was a uh, literary technique you know that was used to contain an embedded narrative a story within a story so uh, if you can see the framework you know frame could be like the narrator who sets the frame 
the narrator who sets the frame in this case the narrator who uh, who's on the ship on the deck okay talking about uh, floating down the thames that is the frame the, the narrator who sets the frame and then you have uh, marlow you know he is described as sitting cross legged on the deck leaning to one side and when he begins speaking he bends his arm from the elbow uh, with his palm forward almost like a buddha and he begins talking about his experiences so it is a uh, marlow the narrator taking over from the frame narrator so it's the story of marlow's experiences embedded within the other story of the frame narrator okay so story embedded within another story now uh, look at the setting here see uh, the setting uh, talking about the time okay latter part of the 19th century probably some time between 1876 and 1892 now setting as far as the place is concerned see it opens on the thames river outside london where marlow is telling the story that makes up heart of darkness events of the story take place in brussels at the company's offices and in congo then a belgian territory uh, main character protagonist is charlie mar so uh, this tells us very clearly how the, the setting is used in order to bring in the embedded story look at the picture here in this slide you can see i think this is from spark notes or something see almost like a comic the depiction you know how marlow is sitting leaning to one side and he is telling the story uh, the deck of a ship can be seen and it, they are floating down the thames so heart of darkness is a frame story which is a story within a story the first narrator sets the scene describes the boat and the thames and introduces marlow the primary narrator the structure mimics the oral tradition of storytelling readers settle down with the sailors on the boat to listen to marlow's narrator so when marlow when the first narrator tells us that you know here we are on the deck of the ship floating down the thames with uh, uh, london uh, on the banks the greatness of the city can be seen the time is uh, you know when the sun is about to set you can see that um, there is a gloomy light everywhere which is also symbolic actually you know uh, though they are talking about africa which is called like the dark continent and the title itself is heart of darkness it is when they show london although marlow although conrad describes london as a great city great power and glorious and everything uh, the the light around london is dark and dismal and uh, you know gloomy so uh, it is very symbolic right though uh, africa is called the dark continent yet the darkness is something that has spread its gloom over a big colonial city like london so there is symbolism in that also now uh, we when uh, the first narrator tells us you know where we are and then marlow starts telling the story where are we as readers we can picture ourselves sitting on the deck with him listening to his story so it, it's like an oral storytelling like uh, you know oral storytelling when stories are passed on by word of mouth right you gather in front of the storyteller and listen to him Right? so we are also like that sitting in front of marlow listening to his story so uh, oral storytelling brings with it associations of fables and legends and epic journeys readers are introduced to the idea that the tale marlow tells is a quest a myth a quest myth is one of the archetypal patterns you know there is always uh, in a quest myth uh, the hero goes in search of something uh, undergoes a journey of hardship Uh, in search of what he has gone to find finds it and then comes back right so the, there are hardships and hindrances that the hero has to overcome in a quest so a story within a story technique also distances conrad as the author so when the story is uh, told by marlow there is a distance between conrad it's not a first person narration right so there is a distance between the author and the character who tells us the story now readers are unsure whether they are reading a tale at second or third hand it becomes difficult to distinguish whether the opinions expressed are conrad's own or the narrator this is exactly what conrad wanted right because he was 
he wanted uh, not to alienate his british readers so he uses the distance that marlow as a narrator could afford him heart of darkness opens on a group of sailors sitting on the deck of nelly a small ship the name of the ship is nelly uh, among them is charles marlow he speaks cryptically saying things like and this also has been one of the dark places of the earth looking at london this also has this is one of the you know greatest places but it's also be, become the one of the darkest places why would he say that what do you think why would he say looking at london that this has been a great place but also one of the darkest places why london as a symbol of colonialist power right uh, as a symbol of imperialist power uh, becomes a place that is uh, responsible for so much of looting and plunder in various parts of the world so that way it is also uh, a dark place right a place uh, made out of the uh, suffering and misery of so many people in the colonies so going on now marlow framed how is uh, marlow framed in the story the metaphor is that of a framed picture a picture representation of reality cut off from the real world by the frame and meant for the seeing eye right it's like you know we we are focusing uh, exactly on what is shown within the frame uh, but there may be variations and complications of such frames so how how does this happen the heart of darkness begins on board the nelly a small ship more on the thames river in london after describing the river and its slow moving traffic the narrator uh, the unnamed narrator offers a short description of london's history to his companions who with him lazily launch on the deck waiting for the tide to turn with him are the director of company that is their character uh, their captain uh, a lawyer an accountant and marlow the novel's protagonist as the sun sets the four men become contemplative and brooding eventually marlow breaks the spell of silence by beginning his tale about his voyage to congo the other men remain silent while marlow collects his ideas after which he begins the story proper the remainder of the novel becomes with few exceptions uh, the narrator's report of what marlow tells him and the others on board the nelly Conrad's novel is thus a frame story or a story within a story. So you see how this whole uh, structure is created by Conrad. So first we have uh, a narrator setting the uh, you know setting the scene actually for Marlowe to start telling the story. And once he tells the story, uh, we are taken to uh, you know the depths of the story, and then the rest of the story. we hear through the narrator uh, of what marlow has narrated to him so um, conrad story thus becomes a frame story or like a story within a story in the heart of darkness the frame narrator introduces marlow to the reader uh, conrad employs counter discourses within the framework of the narrative by subverting the traditional genre the method is dialogic that means through dialogue as well as dialectical uh, that is by presenting opposing forces you know concerned with or acting through opposing forces so these are the ways in which you know uh, he brings out uh, the story through dialogues and also through presenting opposing forces marlow's remark uh, exposes the relative naivete and uh, limited insight of the frame narrator and alerts the reader as to the complexities that they might encounter in the point of view that is being presented and the unreliability of any of the several narrators within the stories narrating frames this is one of the uh, things that makes this novel very modern you know unreliability of the narrators so the, this is also something very consciously done so that you know there is an ambiguity left to everything so action and adventure Uh, action is central to an adventure story right this is an adventure story and action is part and parcel of that in conrad the adventure story is predicated on inaction and lethargy 
so uh, I, we told i told you know how conrad writes very differently from everyone else uh, who were writing at that time uh, in those days adventure story meant action but in conrad the adventure is predicated it's based on the action and lethargy while we must recognize how conrad depended on certain conventions of the adventure story we must stress his departure from melodrama and a deviation from anticipation there is no glorification of travel there is no glorification of adventure and you know uh, uh, living in far off lands there is nothing like that okay so he de- he does use some of the elements of a travel story yet he departs from it uh, how does he depart see his reliance on passivity inertness and immobility is one of his major achievements in reshaping the romantic sense of adventure so uh, we have another uh, uh, approach to adventure when conrad narrates because in his narration adventure is not about action it is about immobility it is about passivity it's about inertness or rather lack of action in telling the story the narrator stops comments alerts the inner listeners of his yarn the narrative gets halted is infinitely regressed yet he writes to blackford that his story is nothing but action although he writes to the editor of the blackford magazine that his story is all about action this action is something that happens in the mind because uh, it's not a physical action that happens okay there is inertness there is passivity there is halting at several points where you go back and think about something that has happened earlier so in a way we can say the action is even regressive it goes backwards he stops he comments he alerts the reader okay and makes us look deeper into what has happened so the action is something that happens on a inner level also uh, conrad's skepticism towards action must have sprung from on the one hand the lost cause of the polish freedom fighters and on the other the sham civilizing mission of the african adventurous so two of the things that might have made him lose faith in this whole uh, uh, you know action adventure thing would have been probably how his parents suffered being polish freedom fighters how they suffered and almost lost their lives because of that and also his first hand knowledge of how this whole uh, uh, hypocritical mission of civilizing africa Uh, was done right so he he had first hand uh, experience of that so probably that is why he became skeptic towards this whole action adventure thing so the adventure if it can be so called that he portrays is the adventure inwards something that he makes us look inwards the journey into the inner heart of africa not the literal kind as displayed in the conventional adventure tales so uh, the journey of the reader into the heart of uh, what was happening you know in africa in the name of civilization so that is what is uh, this action here the adventure that is happening is a journey in boat that action with a difference so there are times when marlowe is on the verge of some action but the nature of the problem he confronts is such that no action on his part can redeem the situation for him hence his propensity for inaction and evasion so uh, there are instances in the novel when he is on the brink of some action but uh, it's not action that can actually free a situation that can redeem a situation it's rather his inaction uh, that could you know free him from that so his dilemma is almost hamletian in its unnaturalness like hamlet's dilemma uh, who's hamlet character Character. He's the protagonist of. Uh, protagonist. Who? Uh, who's the writer of Hamlet? Shakespeare. 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 Yes. Shakespearean tragedy, Hamlet. Right. You do you know the story of Hamlet? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So Hamlet was the prince of Denmark. Okay. and uh, he was a university student okay and he is uh, suddenly called from the university because his father the king of denmark has uh, been killed okay is found dead okay and hamlet when he comes back you know he's a young university student he comes back and he suspects that his father the king was 
was not uh, did not die of natural circumstances rather was murdered so he uh, wants to find out who could have been the murderer of his father and he has very strong doubts he thinks that his mother gertrude uh, has uh, sided up with his father's brother and uh, he wants to take revenge on uh, the murderer of his father okay and uh, yet he is he is faced with a very human dilemma dilemma means like you are in a quandary you don't know what action to take because as a university student who is uh, thinking of taking revenge for the death of his father he cannot just go and kill someone without being sure of who might have been his father's murderer and even after knowing that even after you know he employs various techniques in the uh, drama in the play in order to find out the true murderer of his father even after knowing that he hesitates so that is called the hamletian dilemma to be or not to be that kind of dilemma is there you know i as a human being he just cannot go and blindly take the life of another human being so he is faced with a very human dilemma so his uh, dilemma or uh, marlowe's dilemma his dilemma is almost hamletian in its unnaturalness hamlet's words to be or not to be symbolizes this perpetual dilemma in fact uh, the tragic uh, flaw of hamlet is his inability to take action okay uh, action is suitable or possible only under normal worldly circumstances but not in the kind of situation he finds himself in this is a similar situation that marlow finds himself in you know action is possible only if there is like a very clear cut black and white division of what is to be done but in a gray area you know how do you take uh, action so this is the same dilemma that is faced by marlow as he says at one such conjecture see look at the quote here i fretted and fumed and took to arguing with myself whether or no i would openly talk openly with kurds but before i could come to any conclusion it occurred to me that my speech or my silence indeed any action of mine would be mere futility what will i achieve by talking openly to kurds just like hamlet thought what will i achieve by taking revenge right will i achieve anything what actually happens right as logical rational human beings we do think of such things the same thing happened to marvo if i speak openly to kurds about how kurds was uh, the company's man who was positioned in stanley falls remember so he went there as uh, an employee of the whole colonizing mission but once he goes there uh, he becomes renegade he, he runs like he becomes uh, his own person he becomes a sole white authority in that part of uh, the colony yeah. and and Uh, as uh, the sole authority he takes over uh, everyone and everything there he becomes a sole authority which is not uh, the reason why he was sent there by the imperialist mission so when marlow goes there to bring kurds back uh, uh, to to you know civilization he thinks of talking openly to kurds but then he thinks what am i going to achieve with my open speech or my silence or indeed anything it would just be mere futility it would be of no use what did it matter what anyone knew or we know what did it matter who was manager one gets sometimes such flashes of insight it was an insight that he got he suddenly had this flash of insight which made him question what is the effectiveness of him asking anyone any question the see in the essentials of this affair lay deep under the surface beyond my reach beyond anyone's reach beyond my power of meddling so the essentials of this you know question was something that was uh, beyond the power of what marlow could interfere and set right right this whole colonial enterprise it was like a huge machinery over which marlow had no power so what would be gained by asking this question so the same kind of uh you know feeling of not having the power to make any change leads to inaction and passivity that same kind of uh question that hamlet had asked himself so that's why we can trace a parallel between marlow's inaction 
and the sense of dilemma that Hamlet felt before he was, you know, uh, able to take revenge. Then going on to uh, further elements of literary analysis, see uh, the questions that we ask ourselves, okay? Marlowe embarks on an adventurous journey, but does that mean that his journey therefore becomes an adventure? He is a going on an adventurous journey as a seaman, but does that element alone make his journey an adventure? Right? It, it becomes an adventure in his mind, in his heart, right? More than a physical adventure. How is that different from the conventions of the genre? It is very different from the conventions of the genre because those days, the kind of adventure books that were coming out was based on actual, literal adventure, not uh, the kind of adventure that Conrad was writing about. How does Marlowe's character contribute to his way of telling the tale. So Marlowe's character is introspective, brooding, you know, he's not like the other sailors that you would find who tell the story and it's over. Okay, but Marlowe's narration is not like that. Like we read earlier how he stops and how he thinks about it and how he asks questions and how he makes us go back. So the kind of narration that Marlowe's, Marlowe's character uh, has is something that makes us think uh, uh, and go back to, uh, to reflect on what has happened. Is it a psychological drama, not so much a journey in space and time as a spiritual descent into the heart of darkness, similar to a Dante's Inferno, Dante's Inferno, Dante journeying into the midst of hell in order to free his beloved, okay? So Dante, who is the author of Divine Comedy, in which he goes to uh, Inferno, he goes to um, uh, Hell, actually. And he has to, one of the hurdles that he has to uh, overcome is jumping over the back of Satan. So such difficulties Dante faces. And uh, what is the difficulty that Marlowe faces? Is it, is it like a psychological drama? It is true, right? The journey becomes more a journey into the interior of, uh, you know, the protagonist's heart uh, and reveals the heart of darkness within, uh, you know, uh, within the colonial heart, okay, the whole colonial enterprise, uh, looting countries like uh, Africa and feeding uh, European countries, feeding wealth into the European countries which is symbolized by the very ship Nelly that they're floating on down the Thames, the majestic river Thames, as opposed to the dark, uh, unfathomable, mysterious Congo River. Uh, comparison of Conrad's Heart of Darkness to Dante's Inferno is extremely perceptive. For both stories involve the journey of a moral person into a place that lies beyond morality. Uh, so uh, there, there is no question of right or wrong. You're going beyond that point there. In Dante's case, it's literal hell. In Marlowe's, it is a Belgian Congo. Going into Belgian Congo was no less than going into hell. Both men move from the threshold of ordinary life into these extraordinary places. And both are horrified and fascinated by what they see on their travel. So something that changes them uh, forever. Both men are compelled to travel deeper and deeper into their respective territories in search of something. The way to heaven for Dante and uh, finding Kurtz for Marlowe. The further they travel, the more appalling are the sights they behold. So the more terrible become the sights that they see. You know, as they travel, their inherent morality and sanity is tested by their circumstances. So everything that they believe in, everything that they know, as the center of their existence get, gets tested, gets very strongly tested as they journey deeper into uh, their voyage. In the end, both men must pass through a final trial in order to escape the places that they are in. Dante must uh, climb over Satan's back, while Marlowe must resist the awful lure of Kurt's madness. So Kurt's madness is something that seems very uh, attractive at that point, you know, because having journeyed down this dark Congo River, facing all kinds of difficulties, seeing all kinds of violence, seeing all kinds of death, 
escaping into a mad world like that of Kurt seems to be appealing. But they both, whether it is uh, Dante or uh, Marlowe, they both have to overcome their hardest trials by retaining their sense of purpose, their sanity, their, re their sense of purpose. So as Marlowe would say, my purpose was to stroll the shade for a moment, but no sooner within than it seemed to me I had stepped into the gloomy circle of some inferno. So uh, uh, traveling in the shade, you know, the, the, going into the verge of madness, he understood this is like getting into hell, inferno. So that is what Kurtz had fallen into. So he loses, you know, himself completely in the wilderness of Africa. Uh, you can see that uh, comic, uh, you know, that uh, picture there, like a graphic novel. There is a graphic novel of uh, Heart of Darkness. Okay? So look at that character saying, see, the, they were no colonists. They were conquerors and they grabbed what they could get. So we, they were, you cannot give them even the word colonists. They were just uh, plunderers, thieves, robbers, grabbing what they could get. It was just robbery, aggravated murder on a grand scale, the conquest of the earth. So the European powers, you know, dividing up the world, grabbing what they can. So this was like a mad scramble for the wealth of all the other nations in order to feed their own insatiable hunger. Now going on. So before the Congo, I was a beast, Conrad was to say later. The effect of Congo remained with Conrad for many years. Like I told you, like say, like soldiers feel post-traumatic stress disorder, something like that. The effect of Congo remained with Conrad for many years. An outpost of progress was not a profound enough journey into the depths of darkness that Conrad had experienced in Congo. As he explores the dark recesses of his heart and mind via Marlow, we as readers are also conducted through the same route. So his experiences, the trials and tribulations that he had undergone in Congo, uh, he narrates through Marlow. And we are taken on this journey through the narration of Marlow. Uh, see, uh, and the way we read it, you know, depending on who we are, our own position as a reader, we can have different approaches to reading this novel. Right? An African reading about this would have a different sentiment, right? Reading about how his country was plundered, how his people were murdered, right? He would have a different uh, view towards this. An Indian, a woman, right? So uh, an Indian as a, a post-colonial country ourselves, we can also have several uh, points where we can completely identify with the Africans and how they were treated. Uh, and as a woman, you know, uh, as a woman also uh, being uh, not given the equality, you know, the no gender equality. Uh, so how he says, you know, to his publisher, no women characters, uh, no love angle. So a woman feels unseen and unheard. So depending on who reads this book, we can have different uh, readings of the text you know, uh, a post-colonial, uh, so an African, an Indian, a woman, a post-colonial subject will each read the text differently and accordingly it will mean different things to different people. Not in the sense of its literal ambiguities, but also because of the subject positions of the reader. So we as a subject, uh, how do we position ourselves in the world? That will depend uh, on how we look at this text also. It's very true, right? Now going on, so structures in Heart of Darkness. So Conrad breaks the story into three sections. Okay, In the first, Marlowe travels from Europe to the Central Station. In the second, he travels from Central Station to the Inner Station. And then in the third, he comes back to Europe. He returns to Europe. So the convention is simple of a tale within a tale told by a British gentleman to other British gentlemen. And uh, uh, there is a quotation from your book. You see, Marlowe talks about uh, breathing dead hippo, so to speak, uh, and not to be contaminated. There is a smell that he feels of like dead hippo. And he feels that 
can't bear it anymore uh, but and curds you know another important thing curds when he dies the last word that he says is the horror the horror you know the the words escaping from the mouth of this dying man in his last breath is the horror the horror this has been in all of literature you know this has been a, a, a dying statement that has been much written about much thought about much conjectured about why did kurt say the horror the horror there have been various interpretations to why kurt says the horror the horror why does marlow like to kurt's intended about kurt's last words does he lie at all okay so when uh, kurt when uh, marlow goes after kurt's dies marlow goes to meet kurt's intended the woman he was supposed to marry his fiance he goes to meet her and he tells her you know she is someone who is be faithful to kurt and she wears black and mourning for kurt and she thinks kurt was uh, was an ideal gentleman which is nothing like the real kurds okay so but uh, marlow does not want to break her uh, idea of who kurds was and so he lies to her and he tells her that his last words were about you why does he do that so these are questions that we do ask ourselves okay what does marlow actually do in the story as an adventurer what does he actually do in the story similarly the frame narrator showing a remarkable acumen in his understanding of marlow's character warns us about the complexities of marlow's tale so uh, marlow's tale is also subjective as a narrator he is unreliable at many points now he also the uh, frame narrator tells us how uh, to look at the story that marlow is telling us the yarns of seamen have direct simplicity the whole meaning of which lies within the shell of a cracked nut so when normally seamen are famous for narrating stories of their adventures they go to so many places see so many places uh, i mean see meet so many different kinds of situations and people and when they come back to their land they are well known for narrating stories spinning yarns so usually when a seaman narrates a story Uh, the story can be easily understood you crack that nut you reach the heart of the story and you understand the story but marlow as a narrator marlow is a seaman but as a narrator he is very different from all the other uh, mariners who travel and come and tell these their stories because when marlow tells a story you just get uh, the outer Uh, part of the story the glow of the story and that too you see the elements of the story through a haze through so, through some sort of a mist so there is nothing that is totally fully clear in the way in which marlow narrates which is the way real life is right there, there are uh, things that are uh, never answered there are ambiguities that are never answered so that sort of narration is what marlow uh tells us you know his narration was something which is very modern in that sense right almost post modern in that sense so the yarn seamen uh, the yarns of seamen have a direct simplicity the whole meaning of which lies in the shell of a cracked nut you can easily understand once that nut is cracked you get the uh, you get the heart of the story of what normal seamen narrate but marlow is not a typical a narrator and to him the meaning of an episode was not inside like a kernel but outside enveloping the tale which brought it out only as glow brings out a haze right when something is burning it brings out you know the glow and that glow brings out a haze like a misty haze this is how his narration was nothing very clear cut in the likeness of one of these misty halos that sometimes are made visible by the special uh, spectral illumination of moonshine it's not sunshine that illuminates it's moonshine so uh, in the beginning you know when he sits on the deck and he starts narrating he's sitting cross legged and he bends his arm uh, and he elbows and he reaches out his palms almost looking like a buddha he is compared to something like a buddha and now we read how he narrates a story and how he finds the meaning uh, not in definitive terms not like cracking uh, a nut and getting the whole story 
but rather like you know uh, uh, bringing on the outer elements developing something like a halo that you see in moonshine spectral out like a spectral like a ghostly outline that you see in moonshine not even in clear sunlight so this is uh, something that adds to the uh, whole uh, uh, whole unreliability and whole ambiguity of his narration barlow's narration so conrad himself seems to be sounding a warning signal to the contemporary readers not to expect the realistic kind of fiction that they were wont to expect so uh, the novel heart of darkness is actually uh, pretty small in terms of number of pages but it takes longer time to read because of the depth of the narration okay and conrad is through this kind of you know symbolism that he weaves into it it seems to be telling his readers contemporary readers you know that uh the the fiction that you're going to read is not going to be a realistic fiction like an adventure story it's deeper than that in heart of darkness similarly he introduces the void situation to raise expectations of an adventure he uses an elaborate pattern of voyages the central voyage in this labyrinth of voyage is marlow's visit to the inner station which becomes a quest for curds who then himself grows into an enigma to be unraveled so uh, you find lots of journeys like we said you know the first stage he uh, marlo journeying from europe to uh, the central station then going deeper and deeper into congo finally his journey is about finding curds and then he finds curds uh, curds himself becomes like a journey uh, to find who is curds who is this real curds because curds, curds himself becomes like Uh, an enigma like a puzzle to be solved okay to to be opened up a mysterious enigma to be unraveled to be opened up the quest for the real curds thus replaces the original adventure symbolizing quest for truth so quest for this man uh, an agent of the um, colonial company who becomes totally uh, uh, totally separated from all the colonial Uh, rules and regulations with which he had gone into the heart of africa he loses his uh, sanity he becomes the only white authority in that part of the land and he starts ruling like an uh, like an autocrat there okay so who be, who is curds then who is the uh, what is the real identity of curds that itself becomes an enigma to be solved and uh, marlow's narration is something that does not leave us with clear cut uh, uh, answers his his uh, story is something uh, where we can say he reaches enlightenment in a way if you compare him with buddha you can say he reaches enlightenment but that enlightenment is not something that you can see in uh, bright sunlight but rather a spectral or ghostly illumination that becomes clear that kind of comes into a, a misty haze in moonshine so it's a darkness you know that enlightenment becomes darkness not not in sunlight sort of a darkness an awareness of darkness then uh, approaches to the meaning is marlow a passive receptacle of uh, experience Uh, we have already seen how uh, conrad even while appropriating the genre of adventure story was subverting it he was using uh, heart of darkness as an adventure story but he was this is not the regular adventure story that you find he was turning it upside down subverting it instead of using action as it was commonly understood and which was such an important component of any adventure he relied on just the opposite that is in action and passivity so we have already discussed So we discussed how various layers of voyages there is inner voyages and also outer voyages are submerged into the narrative framework chiefly marlow's uh, into the heart of darkness so marlow's narrative about traveling into the heart of darkness which becomes both an outer uh, voyage and also an inner voyage the frame narrator tells us that marlow was an untypical seaman the words that could be said of him was that he did not represent his class he was a seaman but he was a wanderer too 
while most seamen led if one may uh, so express it as sedentary life their minds are of the stay at home order and their home is always with them the ship and so is their country the sea one ship is very much like another and the sea is always the same so uh, a, a mariner leads a sedentary life because the things that hold him dearly to life are constants the sea the ship but marlow was not like that he was a wanderer who so he journeyed deeper into life to see more things uh, both in the literal sense and also in the metaphorical sense now virginia wolf also draws the same kind of inference about marlow marlow was one of those born observers who are happiest in retirement he was happy to not be like you know a soldier of action he was happy to be sitting uh, in a far corner observing the action uh, generally writers are like that you know they are people who would be observing everything keen observers Uh, but his physical inertia does not prevent him from leading a vigorous intellectual life. So, uh, physically they may be inert, right? Not too much of action, but intellectually they lead a very vigorous life, very active life because they uh, think and uh, they really analyze what is happening around them. So you can see the quote there from the text. So Malo talks about what work. Means for him soon after admitting his reluctance to do any work. I like what is in the work, the chance to find yourself. So work is something that allows him to find himself, your own reality for yourself, not for others. What no other man can ever know. So work is something that leads you to find yourself, your reality, not what one can know, not another man can know. they can only see the near show and never can tell what it really means so work in its external appearance is something that others can see but can never know what it means to another person uh, and marlow's adventure then is an inner one so you find uh, the action adventure happening in in his uh, inner mind not in a physical sense it seems somehow to throw a kind of light on everything about me and into my thoughts uh, not very clear and yet it seemed to throw a kind of light here light and darkness black and white operates as complex symbolic pairing so he gets enlightenment he does uh, understand things but it's not a uh, uh, light that is thrown into his enlightenment it's rather an awareness of the darkness surrounding him that he becomes enlightened so delayed decoding okay so conrad says in this famous preface that to start by the power of the written word to make you hear to make you feel it is before all to make you see that and no more is everything so his task is to make you see you know uh, the written word uh, you know using the power of the written word uh, so that you hear so that you feel and you see what is happening see means not just see literally right see deeper marlow perceives the difficulties of a storyteller who is trying to tell an incredible tale no it's impossible it's impossible to convey the life sensation of any given epoch of one's existence that which makes its truth its meaning so it's very hard to uh, narrate everything you know not leaving out a, a, any little bit it's it's not very easy to do that it is something that has to be felt also so to exactly convey his own sense impressions to his audience he follows the same route which he had taken while experiencing the sequence of events in his brooding meditative mind so when he was experiencing certain uh, certain things uh, during his journey the way he experienced it you know that is the same method that he uses when he is narrating that experience to us his readers so what does he do none of his understandings are conveyed immediately and we have to wait for another dimension to unveil so when he says that he saw something he doesn't talk about it more at that point but later on when the story progresses we are taken back to that point and then more light is shed on what has happened and then we understand the deeper implications of what he had experienced so this is a way in which he narrates 
So Jan Watts had called this delayed decoding. So he uh, decodes it, but he doesn't do it immediately. Uh, as soon as something happens, he doesn't decode it for us. There is a delayed decoding. An example of delayed decoding, uh, the sighting of Kurt's station towards the end of part two. The jungle and the woods provided background for the delay, a decayed building. So uh, when they're journeying down the river, uh, there is a good example that we can give of this delayed decoding in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Uh, the example is that of citing Kurt's station uh, towards the end of part two. When they, uh, when they look at and they see Kurt's station, they see uh, around the hut several poles with uh, sort of round decorations on it. Okay, Now look at this. So let me read it. So there was, Marlowe saw through the glasses, the telescope. Uh, no enclosure or fence of any kind, but there had been one apparently for near the house. Half a dozen slim posts remained uh, in a row, roughly trimmed with their upper ends ornamented with round carved balls. So they are approaching Kurtz's uh, station and they see the hut and round the hut uh, they see poles erected and on the poles were these round carved balls. So what this ornamentation was, neither his audience then nor the reader now knows. After considerable time wraps, he tells us what it was. Then I went carefully from post to post with my glass and saw my mistake. So he uh, focused his telescope. Uh, at first, he does not understand what these uh, long posts are with round decorations. Then he focuses his telescope closely uh, on each and every one of the posts and he understands what this was. He saw his mistakes. These round knobs were not ornamental but symbolic. They were expressive and puzzling, striking and disturbing food for thought and also for vultures if there had been any looking down from the sky. But at any event for such ants uh, as were industrious enough to ascend the pole. So when he looks closer, he realizes that these poles were uh, poles erected round the hut of Kurtz's station with the heads of the natives who had been killed. And he says that, you know, it would have been evident if any vultures had been looking down from the sky. Uh, also, if any ants had been industrious enough, they would have climbed up the pole and eaten uh, every bit of uh, the uh, dead man's head. So this is uh, what he says. And the explanation comes a little bit later, only afterwards. Uh, at first, when he tells us that he saw these decorations, he doesn't explain what it is. Only later does he say what it is. So through this method, the text is not progressive, but regressive through memory too, adding to its layered complexity. So when he thinks about it, this memory comes up. And he goes back to telling us what was that that he saw. So this is like a regressive way of narration where memory also plays a part in it. And it adds to the layered element of the story. The narration becomes very layered in this way. And you can see the picture there in this uh, slide. See the poles with the uh, head of the killed natives. When Marlowe talks about symbolism of the poles, Conrad too seems to be consciously making us see further symbolism in the poles. He does not present us with an unambiguous portrayal of Kurtz. So Kurtz's portrayal is not a, a clear-cut portrayal. There are uh, uh, open-ended ambiguities uh, within the portrayal of Kurtz. And the heads are food for the vultures. Uh, vultures also become symbolic then. Vultures are people like King Leopold, uh, the, the colonizers, okay, who are feeding upon these natives, the imperialist forces, all of whom are represented in the lone figure of Kurtz. So Kurtz is the embodiment of the imperialist forces, but uh, facing the deepness and the darkness of the Congo, the heart of Congo, he loses his sense of reality. He becomes an autocrat there. Now, the ants, then if the vultures are symbolic of the big imperialist forces like King Leopold, the ants are the smaller fries, like the managers and the accountants and the brick makers and all of these people who form part and parcel of this 
whole imperialistic venture and they are also people who make money out of these imperialistic ventures so there there is symbolism in that third segment the heads to symbolize something else as warning signals care crows of some sort for the natives a warning not revolt so uh, for in curtis mind these uh, poles were symbolic as warning warning to the natives there then race empire and gender in the heart of darkness so edward gamet one of the earliest critics to recognize the subversive nature of conrad's text he calls it a page torn from the life of the dark continent a page which has either to carefully uh, blurred and kept away from the european eyes so uh, the european eyes do not get to see this dark and uh, dismal side of the colonial enterprise so conrad is bringing that to the european eyes the standard english attitude towards the empire best represented by kipling's notion of the white man's burden Kipling's notion of the white man's burden. Where Kipling says that it is the burden of the white man to civilize these savage uh, countries that they colonize, which we can never agree with, right? So the standard attitude of the English towards the empire was something that resonated with Kipling's attitude of uh, white man's burden. You know, white man's. like it was a burden that they were carrying for the rest of humanity like a philanthropic burden uh, so this was totally uh, something that we can not we can never agree with right so conrad seldom expresses his views openly about imperialism but he made casual contorted references to the folly of nations or to kipling's squint so okay, he calls it kipling's squint you know the the uh, convoluted way in which kipling saw the world right and the folly of nations to believe in their own supremacy so with the so conrad had a totally different view in with regard to this uh, you know the the efficacy of the imperialist enterprise then like marlo who would retort to the station manager's complaint against curtis method conrad's answer to the european enterprise in africa would have been no method at all was there a method uh, uh, of colonization that was happening in africa no there was no method no method was the method and no method means just robbery just plain robbery just plain plundering look at this uh, page that i have taken from the graphic novel look at this see uh, these you know colonialist imperialist uh, officers walking there see uh, what is written there is that see i don't deny there is a remarkable quantity of ivory we must save it at all events but his methods unsound his method is unsound method what method see nevertheless i think mr kurtz is a remarkable man he was so what method there was no method so it was just uh, uh, kurds using his sole authority to loot and plunder and kill so uh, so the station managers complaint against kurds method okay becomes invalid in that sense right because kurds was not employing any method other than making profit Uh, through hook or crook, like it's like saying the end justifies the means. Then talking about the question of race, the Europeans. Uh, so Freslevin is a name that comes up when we talk about race. He was a Danish uh, officer who was killed, and it is his position that Marlow gets. And why he was killed is very frivolous reason actually, you know. So this Dane is dead even before Marlowe's central narrative begins. Marlowe gets his job, uh, uh, Preslevin, uh, supposedly superior agent of his of the imperial forces, dies under uh, the silliest of circumstances, fight over two black hands. So Marlowe gets his job because Preslevin died, and Preslevin died because of the fight, a silly fight over two black hands. Uh, and a member. So um, the question that comes up is: Frazier Levin, as a member of the superior race, okay, uh, uh, as a civilizer of the savages, 
he could pick up a quarrel and batter the chief of the village he was the gentlest quietest creature that ever walked on two legs so fraselevin is described as the quietest and gentlest of creatures that ever walked on two legs but uh, in a fight over two black hands he bashes and he kills the uh, black uh, chief of the village okay now he went out of his head because he was out there for two years in the noble cause the noble cause is written within double inverted commas because it is the imperialistic cause okay amassing wealth for the uh, imperialist countries so fraselevin went out into uh, the heart of congo and he lived there long enough to lose his uh, mind and in that moment of losing his mind he kills the african chief of the village finally the blacks kill him marlo now the wise wise narrator tells us that i should think the cause of progress got the hands anyhow so what killed the hands the, the cause of progress right again progress in a cynical way got the hands and um, fres 11 was killed by the son of the chief so uh, at this stage hence assume greater significance than their status as mere fowls the implication seems to be that the cause of progress smells foul so they they don't become just fowls there f o w l fowl f o w l means hence okay but here see f o u l means bad smell so the bad smell emanating from the so called sense of progress is something that leads to the death of this danish uh, officer of the uh, colonialist enterprise and it is his job that uh, marlo gets now uh, from the novel see apparently one of the steamboat captains had been killed in a fight with the natives this was my big break and it made me all the more excited about poem it was so this is a quote from the novel okay i'm reading out what marlo says so one of the steamboat captains that is he's referring to fraselever had been killed in a fight with the natives this was my big break and it made me all the more excited about poem it was only months and months later while attempting to recover what was left of the captain's body that i found out that the fight was over some hens yes two black hens fraselever was a guy of spain he was danish i he thought he got a raw deal so he went ashore and started to hammer the chief of the village with a stick uh, so this is what he did okay uh, fraselever i wasn't surprised to hear this and at the same time hear that fraselever was the nicest quietest guy they had ever met i'm sure he was but he'd already been out there in the jungle on his noble mission for a couple of years and probably needed to make himself feel big so he beat the chief in front of a big crowd of stunned villagers until one of them supposedly the chief's son tried jabbing the white man with a spear it worked of course he got fresel even right between the shoulder blades and killed him all the villagers ran off into the forest afraid that something terrible would happen because they killed a white man fresel even's crew also panicked and ran away nobody seemed to care about picking up the body until i showed up and stepped into his shoes stepping into his shoes is very metaphorical there so uh, marlo is stepping into the shoes of this white man who was murdered by the blacks the white man who had lost all his sense of identity and had tried to assume this sort of dictatorial power who was killed by the black man and after they he was killed they all ran away because they they thought it was uh, very bad to kill this white man okay they were afraid of having killed the white man and his bones where his body was lying there till marlo came there and stepped into his shoes so that stepping into his shoes was literally you know uh, taking his shoes and also metaphorically stepping into that same position i felt like i shouldn't let it sit there but when i finally had a chance to meet the man whose job now i had the grass growing through his ribs was tall enough to hide his bones which were all there the body had been not moved okay from that moment on and the grass had grown through the bones and had completely covered the bones the natives had thought white men had magical powers so they hadn't touched his body and they had apparently fled the village their huts were rotting and falling down something terrible had happened after all terror had sent them running through the bush and they never returned i don't know what happened to the hens either 
progress probably got them to in any case because of this fiasco i got my job so this is how marlo narrates to us how he got the job on the ship that was going to congo <clears throat> So uh, Marlow and Kurtz, you know, Marlow's journey to the dark place of Earth inevitably leads him towards Kurtz. Kurtz fascinated Marlow, uh, yet he does not become Kurtz. Uh, words of the intended about Kurtz, see, he died as he lived. So this is what his fiancée says about Kurtz, he died as he lived. Only Marlow and his listeners, like we know the story that Marlow has been narrating, so we know how Kurtz died, okay, and how Kurtz was not the kind of man that his fiance had thought about okay so we know how right and wrong she was kurt's life was a sham a hypocritical mask but his death completely unmasked him why do we say that his death unmasked him uh, at the moment of his death he says two words okay which have been deciphered in several ways he says the horror the horror maybe he was aware you know of how he had spent his life how hypocritical and how violent and how he had spent his life. And that is why he realizes the horror. And that's why he says the horror, the horror. So she was right also because Kurt re relieved the life of uh, relieved the life of deceit and hypocrisy, desire, temptation, and surrender during that supreme moment of uh, complete knowledge. He relived. Okay, I'm sorry, I said. He relived. He, he was able to go through whatever he had experienced in life. All the hypocrisy and sham of his existence passed through his eyes and mind in the last moment of his death. And that is why probably he cried those two <coughs> famous words, the horror, the horror. Uh, Achibe, Chinua Achibe, a Nigerian writer. Okay. <coughs> wrote that heart of darkness depicts Africa as a place of negations. <coughs> In comparison with which Europe's own state of spiritual grace will <coughs> manifest. So uh, Chinua Achibi was very critical about uh, the heart of darkness. Hmm? The Chinua uh, Achibi, the writer of Things Fall Apart, very uh, famous Nigerian writer. He said that the way the natives had been portrayed and uh, things uh, in um, the heart of Conrad shows them in a negative light and shows the uh, colonialists, the white imperialists, in a favorable light. Uh, but then, you know, uh, see, when you look at uh, Africa as a metaphysical battlefield devoid of all recognizable humanity into which the wandering European enters at his own peril, we also see that, you know, this might be the way in which uh, the Europeans portray Africa. But uh, when you, uh, when you uh, analyze what happens in the heart of darkness, you realize that the natives had restraint in their behavior while the whites had none. Marlowe steps into Fezzelevin's shoes. From being a mere metaphor at this stage, the shoes becomes a symbol where they get soaked in the blood, the blood of the imperialist mission. And talking about the natives who howled and leaped and spun and made horrid faces, he brings in the contrast between the humanity of these savages and the inhumanity of the civilized people. So the so-called civilized people, the so-called uh, colonialists are the ones who are inhuman when you compare with the natives. Though the natives might be wearing weird costumes and jumping about and making howling sounds, they are the ones who are more human uh, than the white man who had completely wreaked havoc in Africa. So it was a white man who had done uh, the utmost uh, harm in exploiting the natives so that he would get his work done. Now, the question of gender, okay? Uh, women, the white women. If Achebe saw the Africans as marginalized, demeaned, and stereotyped, various feminist critics felt that the tale similarly belittled the role of women. Uh, usual <clears throat> feminist objection to adventure stories is that adventures and voyages are the domain for men. Uh, so uh, this is something for men by men. 
okay so read by men also enjoyed by men also women generally have very little role in such uh, stories especially stories of empire uh, in a world where only the fittest survive we notice one after the other the rapacious seekers of fortune either lose their heads or die or kill each other now conrad feels women are not tools in the hands of men but have influence over them Uh, the example that is given is a character of Marlowe's aunt who helps him to find a job, and Conrad had written to his publisher. It is a story of the Congo. There is no love in it, no woman, only incidentally. Yet, uh, although he says you know women uh, are not really present in the novel, he devotes the last part of his story to the woman, like how Marlowe goes back to uh, Belgium and visits. the intended kurt's intended so the last part of the story is in fact devoted to a woman character now the other so the, this is a uh, you know the white women who appeared in the novel uh, one is uh, one is marlowe's aunt who is responsible uh, who is actually influential enough to uh, get him a job on the steamboat and the other is kurt's intended Uh, who is important enough to uh, so that Marlowe goes and visits her after the death of Kurtz. Now the other women uh, that are there in the novel, uh, the African woman, you know, the woman who was close to Kurtz in the inner station, the mistress of uh, Kurtz, okay, uh, who walked with measured steps, uh, draped in striped and fringed clothes, treading the earth proudly. Uh, she uh, she was one of those who admired Kurtz and did not want him to be taken away in the steamboat. So she follows the steamboat on the shore, and uh, when Kurtz is finally uh, taken away, she utters a cry. She was very uh, faithful, as faithful to Kurtz as intended was in Belgium. Okay, so she is Africa to whom civilization has done grievous wrong. Right, Kurtz has. Taken advantage of her, so if Kurt is symbolic of civilization, this woman, his mistress, was symbolic of Africa, who was grievously uh, taken advantage of by civilization, and her tragic and angry aspect is, uh, you know, uh, is a symbol of that. And uh, you you see how she used to, she followed the steamer for as long as she could, and utters a cry. you know a cry that seems to be the very cry of africa to conrad race meant nation more than pigmentation so it will be this dark victim this lady the mistress will be this dark victim of imperialism who will one day strike back at the empire then uh, going to the intended okay now analyzing her intended has no name neither has that uh, african mistress no women are given any names in this novel intended has no name kurt street her treats her like a possession calls her my ivory my station my intended etc and kurt dies marlo goes looking for her and uh, now he goes looking for her for two reasons one is curiosity the other is to uh, you know give a uh, the memory of kurds and is intended to the past so to kind of you know uh, tie the last knot in that story which is over <clears throat> so her ignorance is monumental so she lives in a bubble world of her own and she does not know anything about kurds the man yet she believes in him so it's for this very reason that every word she says about kurds is true but only in their ironical sense so she she uh, Uh, she uh, believes in kurds and everything about kurds and she believes him to be a noble person uh, so it's all true in an ironical way so she is just one more european who has constructed kurds so uh, the idealized notion of the adventurer the european adventurer uh, voyaging to far off lands so he's just another blindfolded european who has constructed uh, a kurd uh, a, a, a colonialist uh, adventurer who in actuality is nothing short of a violent um, a violent plunderer so but in the end the woman becomes a tool in the hands of conrad to wrap up the significance of margot's experience 
some of the modernist methods which he anticipates were ambiguity distancing devices to effect in personality avoidance uh, of romanticizing tendencies and multiplicity of points of view so what are the modernist uh, tendencies or modernist uh, things that you will find in the heart of darkness see ambiguity okay no sense of uh, you know uh, everything is uh, taken with a sense of doubt ambiguous And then distancing devices to effect in personality so uh, th- there's no subjectivity he uses other narrators in order to bring in the objectivity then romanticizing uh, tendencies are avoided and he also presents the same thing with multiple points of view so these are parts of uh, you know the things that make this novel a modern novel Uh, another uh, thing is uh, you know uh, conrad uh, rejects the definite article in his title see heart of darkness uh, a darkness in his title can be an allusion to the geographical appellation for africa as a dark continent so the name for africa is a dark continent the dark continent but here he does not use the definite article he just titles his book heart of darkness what is this darkness then right so uh, is it the darkness uh, of kurtz's own heart of darkness or is it the darkness that is part of the european uh, adventurer the european entrepreneur who voyages to these distant places what is darkness then in that context the cry the last cry of kurtz uh, becomes very relevant very important when he dies with the last words the horror the horror so we imagine that kurtz might have understood you know the horrifying aspect of his life so far in that dying moment <clears throat> then uh, again comparing uh, marlow and kurtz you know marlow has an ambivalent attitude towards kurtz through kurtz's dying words of self judgment marlow understands the real nature of man no eloquence could have been so withering to one's belief in mankind as its final burst of sincerity it's at the dying moment that kurt's vision becomes clear that that his words uh, echo with sincerity because he realizes the horrifying life that he has been leading the last words were an affirmation a moral victory marlow says that's why i have remained loyal to kurt's to the last so in the last moment we can say kurds won over the devils that he had to cross or the hindrances that he had to cross because he saw the truth before he died he saw the horrifying nature of the truth that he was living before he died so that is the meaning of his two words the horror the horror now intended okay malo tells her intended the lie that the last word kurds pronounced was her name why does malo tell a lie and this is an ending which raises more question than gives answers very modernist okay uh, raises more uh, ambiguity than giving answers just as marlow's attitude towards kurds has undergone uh, change so is his attitude towards women particularly the intended has changed so uh, marlow uh, before kurds dies when he says the horror the horror marlow realizes that kurds has changed and marlow's attitude to kurds changed and similarly when he meets the intended his attitude towards her also changed in contrast to kurt she was so true while kurt was not at all true to her not at all loyal she was so true she had a mature capacity for fidelity for belief and for suffering these are values that we know conrad appreciated and conrad valued now uh, the, an- another topic that we have to talk about is the apocalyptic vision Uh, apocalypse is uh, the word for the ending of the world okay apocalypse when everything ends apocalyptic vision of the collapse of the world becomes a prominent feature of modernist weltanschauung weltanschauung is a german word okay that means a world view or the total idea of society and its purpose so in this apocalyptic moment when everything uh, collapses you know heart of darkness represents uh, an early modern manifesto in the direction of the apocalypse so in the modern world nothing is steadfast everything is collapsed be it relationships be it 
uh, human uh, philanthropic missions, everything collapses. It's an apocalyptic world. And Weltanschauung is the German word that talks about this apocalyptic vision. Moving towards a universal dissolution, darkness then becomes a concluding invocation in which everything, uh, the saving illusion of the intended faith is an empty, uh, in an empty deal is swallowed up. So even that belief of the intended becomes swallowed up in this apocalyptic final vision of the darkness that is present in the novel. Now, how is myth used in this novel? Okay, the myth that we can connect to uh, is the myth of uh, Dr. Faust, uh, or actually Faust. Okay. The myth that Conrad has integrated into the structure of Heart of Darkness is that of Faust. Now, Faust is uh, a book by Christopher Marlowe. Okay, uh, Goethe was the original author, but uh, Christopher Marlowe has written uh, Faustus, uh, where uh, the story in Faustus is of a man, a very scholarly person, very knowledgeable, who strikes up a pact with Mephistopheles, the devil. And he says that in return for enjoying all the wealth and pleasures and joys and decadence of the world, he would pledge his soul to Mephistopheles. Okay? That is the story of Christopher Marlowe's Faustus. Now, we can strike a parallel between Heart of Darkness and Faustus. How? See, Kurtz is the Faustian character and is Charlie Marlowe's answer to Christopher Marlowe's hero. So, Kurtz becomes similar to Faust, okay? Uh, Kurtz is someone who has uh, given up his life to just experiences, okay? No restraint, whether it is uh, in his relationship with uh, his mistress or in, the, in his relationship with the blacks uh, that he rules over like a dictator. So there is no restraint. And Faust is also, there is uh, no restraint, okay? He it wants to experience every pleasure in uh, uh, in the world, okay, that was a tragic flaw. That desire to experience was the tragic flaw that led to his undoing, that led to his end. The same sort of uh, uh, tragic flaw is what leads to uh, Kurtz's undoing. So that is, uh, you know, in terms of myth, this is where we can draw a parallel. Now, another myth that you see is the quest myth where the hero embarks on a hazardous journey to achieve a goal. In Heart of Darkness, Kurtz undertakes the journey first, but in this quest, he succumbs to the temptations. So uh, we talked about Dante's uh, divine comedy, how he journeys to Inferno and how he has to overcome so many obstacles. Similarly, Kurtz undertakes a journey here, but in his journey, he falls a prey to the temptations. He is not able to overcome the temptations. Marlowe embarks on another journey, but uncertain quest, okay? And his quest targets undergo shifts until Kurtz himself, or rather the truth about the elusive hero becomes his chief target. So uh, the second character, that is Marlowe. Marlowe is also embarking on a quest. For him, the quest was first a physical one where he was journeying down the river Congo to reach the inner station. But later on, the quest becomes a quest for this person called Kurtz. And once he sees Kurtz, the quest again shifts and changes to understand who is Kurtz. You know, who? what is the reality of this character Kurtz? The, deeper reality of this uh, uh, persona that is Kurtz. So uh, the truth about this elusive hero becomes the quest for Marlowe. And this does not end in expected results and subverts the quest in a modern manner. So he's never able to really fully understand who Kurtz was. And that itself uh, subverts this whole, uh, uh, whole myth of the quest. Okay. And it becomes more modern because uh, it becomes the novel gets a more modernist approach because of the ambiguity with which Marlowe is left. The Christian myth, uh, okay, the other myth that we can read uh, into this novel is that of the Christian myth of corruption of Adam and Eve in Aden. Uh, also appears in reference to the snake, the hissing, Mephistopheles appearing, etc. 
the the very river is pictured as a snake you know as a snake lying across uh, congo and there is an image of the snake shedding its skin so all these are images that can draw our attention to the myth of uh, adam and eve being tempted by satan in the form of a serpent in eden and so also the appearance of mephistopheles like the devil appearing these are things that draw our eye to the christian aspect of this myth so there is a quest myth and also the christian myth so this uh, and the novel finally ends with kurt realizing uh, the truth of what his life had been that is why we have you can see the picture of kurt's lying there with the last dying words written there the horror the horror so that's what this uh, book is about so uh, i think uh, with that uh, i can uh, complete that uh, novel and then we stop sharing uh, if there's anything that you want to ask me so uh, can you hear me yes ma'am yes. okay uh, so i hope the novel was clear to you i have uh, covered every topic that is given in your uh, study material and once you uh, uh, listen to this and go through i will send you the powerpoints on the whatsapp group and once you uh, complete you know uh, i mean uh, if you have listened carefully to me you go back to the book and also look at the powerpoint that i'll be giving you and also further material from the net that i will give you uh, this novel should be very easy and also it's an important novel it's often been asked in the questions you know whether it's your assignments or the uh, paper that you have to write it's pretty important novel also so do pay attention and go to it and uh, read it up while the lecture is still clear in your mind that's my suggestion Yes, definitely, yeah. ma'am. <laughs> Great. All right then. So, shall I call it a day? Thank you, ma'am. You're very Thank welcome. You, ma very well. Bye, bye, bye then. Huh? Bye. Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Bye, <clears> everyone. <throat>